address the large questions uh, is to try to approach the unknown through the known, uh, to understand what it was that we were doing in our uh, effort at raising the water high. The process of understanding what it meant to share code in a way that shared freedom required us to think in lawyer terms about licensing. I met GPLv2 as a lawyer trying to do something about it uh, uh, about 16 months after it met the world. Richard and I spent the remainder of the next 15 years trying to figure out how GPL3 should be different. Uh, we were uh, drawing freehand, in a sense, uh, without a good enough theory. Uh, and uh, what our colleagues, uh, David Levine and Richard Fontana, have, I think, to present is the theory we didn't have about the work that we uh, didn't really understand how to do. Um, I, 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 I am, of course, now in a world where I can't pay uh, snide respect to titles. The academic titles don't matter to me, but business and professional titles, of course, are completely different. David Levine is the uh, 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 assistant general counsel at Red Hat, uh, representing uh, the, the parts of Red Hat which do what I think of Red Hat as doing, products and technology and uh, things like that. Uh, uh, formerly of the IBM Corporation, like many of us in this room, and of PricewaterhouseCoopers. Uh, David is the lawyer who explains to people joining the board of directors of the Red Hat Corporation, uh, A, what this all is, and B, how we make money from it, which is a really good teaching job. I wish I had that gig. Um, but, but he does it better than I would do it because I would, well, I would say the equivalent in, in the business world of, of epistemic uh, crisis, and I, but, but, but I stick to law school. Um, uh, Richard Fontana, who is uh, senior commercial counsel at Red Hat, who um, that means a lawyer who talks to hackers but is in business. Um, it, well, we met because I needed somebody to help me make GPL3, uh, and Richard was the guy who did that with me, and I told him he could have anything in the world he wanted in the free software business world after we finished that, and apparently this is what he wanted. Um, he, we know that because he's tried other things and this is still what he wants best. Um, and, and it's a pleasure, you know. I mean, if you're in the lawyer making business, which is my day job, uh, it's a pleasure I haven't often had out of the 6,287 actual count law students I have trained over the last 31 years in this place and other similar places. It's really great when, you, when, when somebody you've trained is happy doing the job. Uh, I have to tell you that that's not odds on any of those 6,287 people. And I can't say that Richard is always the happiest lawyer I know, but, 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 but these, are, the, these, are, the, these are the people who understand how win-win solutions actually win. And what they've come to talk about, uh, I, I hope for both me and Yuchai in an educational way, since we are still floundering about this, is what is the theory of what we did at this layer? What, what are these licenses in the end? So I offer you David Levine and Richard Fontana. Thanks, Eben. And uh, we really appreciate your you know, giving us an opportunity to talk here. Um, you, know, you could tell you know, how much respect at least Richard has uh, for you, Evan, based upon sort of the way he's, he's dressed today. For those of you who have worked with Richard over the years, and I've worked with him for at least 10 years, I think this is the first time I've seen you in a suit. Um, I, so. I work in an office of engineers, so that's <laughs> part of the reason. Um, so we're very much honored to, to be here. Uh, I want to start out by acknowledging sort of the uh, work of my colleague, Scott Peterson. So, you know, the concept of FOSS licenses as shared resources isn't new, but I think it was Scott. Someone correct me if I'm wrong. I think it was Scott who put that label on it. So uh, Scott's not here today, but um, uh, wanted to make sure I uh, acknowledge Scott. And he recently wrote a short article about licenses as shared resources, which you can read about on opensource.com. 
So I've been at Red Hat for about 13 years now. When I started, um, or right around the time I started, we created an open source book club within the legal department uh, as a way to make sure that everyone in the department, and you know, we have sort of a broad department, you know, understood you know, the, the foundations, you know, how do we connect with you know, FOSS communities, and so we read a number of books. And so I thought it might be a good idea, Eben, if uh, we started a, uh, a book club here at uh, the SFLC conference uh, every year. I thought it would be sort of a nice tradition to start. And as the inaugural book at, uh, at the conference, I thought maybe we should discuss um, Dr. Seuss's The Lorax. Um, so I assume many of you, you know, remember having the book read to you as a kid or reading it to your kids. Uh, when I was sort of thinking about this, I had to go back and refresh myself because it's been quite a while. So I thought I would sort of take a few minutes to reacquaint you with the book and then um, turn things over to, to Richard. We'll sort of talk about what this means. But um, the Lorax uh, lived in a beautiful forest of truffle trees. And truffle trees, if you've never seen them, have these big, huge manes of, you know, colorful hair. Um, but the villain in the story, known as the Onceler, discovered that there was a huge market for thneeds, try pronouncing that, uh, T-H-N-E-E-D-S, which were made from truffle trees. Uh, and so the Lorax started chopping down truffle trees and building a, man building a factory to manufacture uh, more and more thneeds. And over the protests of the Lorax, the Onceler expanded his factory and invited others to join him, uh, other Onecelers. Uh, and as the factory expanded, they needed more and more truffle trees, and they built increasingly sophisticated machines capable of chopping down large numbers of truffle trees. Uh, the Lorax continued to protest. Uh, I am the Lorax. I speak for the trees. I speak for the trees, because the trees have no tongues. So I'm going to stop there and not tell you how it ends, um, but come back to the ending uh, at the end of our presentation. So, you know, why talk about the Lorax? Well, the Lorax was, you know, trying to preserve the vitality of the forest, the vitality of the truffle trees. So, you know, FOSS licenses, you need similar stewards that will help ensure their vitality, to ensure, you know, the freedom of free software. Um, and you know, without giving away too much about what we're going to talk about, you know, FOSS licenses, as we know, are you know more than mere legal terms. I mean, there's, um, you know, are, they have a constitutional-like function in uh, open source projects. But there's you know really small set of licenses, you know, that are reused without any modification that cover most of you know the FOSS that's in use today. But like all legal texts. You know, they contain terms that are susceptible to dispute. You know, so, um, so who gets to resolve differences and decide what these licenses mean? So is it, you know, a copyright troll, you know, seeking monetary gain? Uh, because they have the ability to influence what, uh, how this gets resolved. You know, is it a company seeking commercial gain through strict license enforcement activities? Um, is it an ill-informed judge, maybe in Germany? Right, uh, seeking to resolve a legal dispute. Um, you know, who gets to decide this? Um, and whoever decides this is going to affect all of us because, uh, you know, open source licenses are shared resources. We all use them. Yeah. So, uh, just to kind of um, explain some of the background to what our, our colleague uh, Scott was was writing about. I think last year when he when he uh, published an article about this. Uh, so uh, we're very used to talking about free software uh, itself as a shared resource. This is this is a very kind of well I don't I don't know if it's well understood, but it's certainly been talked about for for many years. Um, Yohai, for example, I, I believe was the first to talk about um, free software as as commons based uh, peer production. Um, and there's there's you know a whole body of of, of literature that I'm semi familiar with about how uh, free software kind of confounds the notion of the tragedy of the commons, and, and that's all very interesting. Um, so so we, we kind of understand this. We understand that that's a, a great sort of virtuous thing about, about free software and open source. Uh, and, and proprietary software also um, can, can be a shared resource under, under some circumstances. So this is not really 
limited, uh, strictly speaking, to to free software or open source. A, a, there, there, there is non-free software that um, ecosystems and, and industry uh, are dependent on that that functions in a, in a somewhat similar way, and that that we are we all um, kind of depend on 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 that software as providing a framework on which we we build other stuff. Uh, so I think this is kind of you know th this aspect of software as a shared resource is well understood. Uh, it is not necessarily appreciated by the larger society of um, you know users of, of software um, until until something disastrous happens, like with Heartbleed and, and OpenSSL, for example. Uh, so uh, one step beyond that is to is to think about legal texts being a shared resource, and this is something that I, I don't think we really see uh, talked about much. Um, I don't think I have, uh, apart from from Scott's uh, essay. But uh, you know, when I when I first was getting into this area of legal practice, I remember I went to a uh, a, a CLE presentation that Karen Copenhaver um, uh, of uh, Choate Hall at the Linux Foundation gave, and she was giving you know she was trying to explain what open source was to an audience full of lawyers. Uh, not very familiar with it, and this was the days when there was a lot of kind of um, froth and hype about open source, maybe more so than today. And she said, you know, it's not really that that exotic. It's just like what we lawyers do. We we are always um, sharing um, templates and contract language, and you know, the, the sort of thing that that transactional lawyers in particular are going to be very familiar with. And I think that's that's right. I I, I think that there is something similar there about how um, lawyers share legal tax in, uh, in a kind of sort of de facto public domains uh, uh, system and how um, in free software, um, software is, is shared. It's, it's not, when we think about um, judicial treatment of such materials, and that's kind of what our talk is, is kind of getting into, it's, it's not, not quite the same thing though because um, in, in ordinary you know, con commercial contract language, um, there's shared text, think of like limitation of liability clauses and things like that. But the, the, the text of a given contract tends to be uh, uh, tailored and unique to a given um, transactional context. It's uh, sort of particular, negotiated by two particular parties, even if it's sort of a one-sided form contract, it's gonna be kind of tailored by the, the um, powerful uh, member of that transaction. Um, so a judicial treatment of, of um, particular commercial agreement may have an impact on the, the shared portion of that contractual text, but because there isn't this standardization in norm, normal contract language, the effect of that on the larger you know, community and industry is gonna be limited. So again, you know, think about you know, how precious these resources are, right? We, when you think about FOSS licenses, um, you know, there's a, you know, a number of studies looking at uh, you know, how frequently they're used but if you pick you know, the top licenses, um, which I think are MIT and GPL, they're used in at least 50% of FOSS projects. Um, and if you go down to the top five, you know, that would cover 75%. So you know, there are these, uh, you know, this very small subset uh, of licenses that, that govern um, most projects in use today. Um, and again, they're used without modification um, or customization. I mean, that's frowned upon. You know, the same with license proliferation. I mean, you don't see new licenses uh, being offered anymore, um, notwithstanding what uh, my friend Jim Wright would like to see, but um, uh, it, it's really a small subset. Um, and, you know, again, it's not merely, uh, you know, licenses aren't just legal terms, right? I mean, the whole foundational document of a project uh, revolves in many senses around the license. I mean, the idea of copyleft, right? I mean, that forms the foundation of many, many projects, right? And that's embodied in the license terms. So yes, it's a legal agreement, but it's, uh, it's much more than that. Um, and then you see, you know, uh, these common licenses that are shared across, you know, many different communities having, you know, differing policy objectives but they all use the same license. You know, think about the Linux kernel project uh, and WordPress. Um, and so the, the, this, um, this feature of free software and open source, this standardization of licenses, this tendency to use a limited set of uh, fixed 
uh, licensed techs. Um, that, that's, there, there are some good um, reasons and, and benefits for that. So the, the standardization reduces uncertainty, increases predictability. These are things that kind of enables the, the um, free and open source software development system to kind of function as its own legal system without sort of typically recourse to the, to the court system. Uh, the kind of the, the the real world of the underlying legal system. Um, you know, there are there are always going to be um, areas that need interpretation in any sort of legal text, and, and open source and free software licenses are no exception. Uh, but um, you know, for for a long time, the the way that that um, resolving differences over interpretation was dealt with, I think, um, you know, from many years of, of observation. Uh, in, in free software culture was through um, the technical communities themselves, not, not through recourse to the courts, not through um, sort of petitioning of, of, of legislatures for, for legislative reform, but, but rather um, you know, taking the, the licenses we had and, and discussing and debating how they should be applied to, to given situations. And the fact that, that the, the set of widely used licenses is so limited and fixed itself kind of encourages um, the development of, of shared interpretations, even, even when there is sort of this, this debate. And um, you know, our, our perspective um, particularly is that, that this, this um, tendency towards certainty and predictability is, is especially important um, in, in thinking about how do we get um, uh, commercial entities not familiar with uh, open source development to get involved in not just use of open source but contribution to open source. Uh, and, and so, you know, until, until you know, what I, what I think of as relatively recently, free software was, had this character of being insulated from the, as I said, the, the underlying legal system. Um, dispute resolution was handled by communities. Um, we started to see some litigation over um, mainly GPL uh, enforcement uh, in the early 2000s, I guess beginning with um, Harold Velta and gplviolations.org. But the, the early wave of um, litigation uh, uh, over GPL enforcement uh, generally involved um, um, community-oriented um, licensors and cases that dealt with relatively simple legal facts, you know, failure to provide source code, very straightforward. Um, there's this um, tendency that I think a lot of us in the, the legal profession have to, to assume that, that, um, that litigation and judicial treatment, judicial dispute resolution is a good thing because it, it, um, it actually enhances certainty. It, it resolves the, the, uh, some of the ambiguities that naturally exist when you have a body of um, you know, legal text that, that we're all using. Um, and uh, you know, our, our, we're going to raise some, some kind of questions about that. Um, just to kind of like set the stage for, for, for the rest of this talk and, and, and to kind of um, uh, state some sort of at a high level what our thinking of is at Red Hat about, about um, license enforcement in, in the area of, of open source. Um, you know, we, we, we see enforcement and compliance. We've been thinking a lot about this uh, in the past few years. We, we, uh, and I, I gave a talk about this at, at uh, FOSDEM earlier this year um, in, in more detail. But, but we, we believe that, that enforcement should be um, judged as to whether it's good or bad by whether it fosters or discourages adoption and, and collaboration. Uh, in development, um, you know, we think that that legal proceedings are, are generally a poor tool for achieving license compliance. Um, I think David will, will touch on some of the reasons for that. Um, where litigation occurs, it should be fair and reasonable and, and predictable. And certainly, um, enforcement should not be be done for a monetary or private gain. So you think about litigation, right? Uh, I mean, the court system, you know, is you know built to serve a specific purpose, which is you know, really to resolve disputes between two parties, right? You have two litigants who come before a court, they have a dispute, and the judge's role is to help resolve that dispute. The lawyer's role is to serve as a zealous advocate for his or her client and um, to take positions based on the specific set of facts in a particular case um, and advocate for the client, but, you know, if you have a dispute involving uh, an open source license, you know, the litigant's perspective, the litigant's interest may be different from the interests of many others who depend on the use of that license. Um, so you can have, you know, litigants in a commercial dispute making arguments that most of us who care about the long-term vitality of an open source license would never make. Um, 
And you know, courts, by their very nature, are limited in terms of their capacity to consider arguments or consider interests of anyone other than you know, the, uh, the parties that are uh, sitting in the courtroom that day. Um, and on the flip side, people who care about licenses, people who care about communities, have a limited ability to impact you know, what goes on in a courtroom. And you know, then the scary part is you know, that judgment uh, that results from that courtroom can have an impact on third parties um, and can affect our freedom, can affect communities um, down the road. So one of the, the problems uh, that, that um, litigation imposes upon um, communities using free software licenses is that we're kind of unusually stuck with the effects of of a bad court decision. You know, we, we'd like to think, and I think I, think I refer to the, the fact that some of, some of the lawyers that I, I've talked to in, in this space actually have some enthusiasm over um, getting more court involvement in adjudicating uh, issues involving free software licenses. But we, we, we see the downside to that because, um, because these licenses are, are a small set of shared kind of standardized legal documents. Um, judicial rulings on them uh, in particular cases with particular facts may have an, an outsized impact on the whole community. And that's partly because they are, are standardized kind of fixed things. But it's also because communities also don't have um, easy solution to responding to a bad court decision. So, um, you know, we have some licenses that have a, this notion of downstream upgradability, like, like the GPL optionally, you know, uh, at the option of the licensor. But, um, you know, many widely used uh, licenses don't have any notion of a license steward and therefore no notion of this kind of magical uh, upgradability that we assume might take care of really bad problems. So David mentioned the MIT license. It's a, a very simple, widely used license. There's no notion of a steward of the MIT license or later versions of the MIT license. And when there is a license steward, there's, there's generally very strong pressure to avoid frequent license revision. So think of how infrequently the GPL was revised over a period of, you know, 25 years. You know, 15 years passed between GPL v2 and GPL v3. The, part of the reason for that is the desire not to, to make rapid revisions because of this desire in the community for kind of a settled um, legal text, text to use that, that communities are reliant on. And even when um, a licensed steward is able to update a license, Many, and, and even when projects can actually, in theory, upgrade by taking advantage of provisions in the license that allow downstream upgradability or you know, optional upgradability in the case of like G, uh, the GPL uh, with the any later version permission, even where that exists, it may not be practical for a project to migrate to a new version for various um, social or technical or other reasons. So, um, so this is this is one of the big problems. So there isn't a, we have we have a small set of, of legal texts. If we have a bad court decision um, dealing with the substance of those licenses, how do we actually um, react to to that sort of bad decision? So, you know, we don't have all the answers, but you know, in you know thinking about you know this problem, you know, what can we do, and. Uh, you know, I think I have you know a wonderful job at Red Hat because you know Richard and I get to think about these these types of problems. There aren't um, I don't know I can ask you know uh, my peers in the audience, but I don't think that there are, you know many lawyers that you know are paid by a company to you know, think about issues like this. So what do we do? You know, how do we become advocates for the licenses that we depend upon? You know, how do we develop strategies for reducing? you know, both the likelihood and the potential impact of ill-informed, you know, judicial decisions or other harmful interpretations. So we want to sort of throw out some ideas to start the discussion, um, but, you know, this isn't meant to be all the answers. Uh, so one place that I would start is I think we need to be, and I think we do in, in many ways, but continue to set expectations within the community and continue to reinforce these. Um, you know, using the court system to uh, obtain license compliance, license interpretations, you know, uh, has a lot of danger associated with that, right? Um, you know, it should be used, you know, extremely sparingly and with a lot of forethought. And as one example, 
you know, should there be, and I guess I'd answer that question, no, uh, test cases brought uh, to try to seek interpretations um, that, you know, some individual would, you know, perceive as, as positive. You know, one of the questions is, you know, how do you decide, or, you know, who appointed you as the spokesperson for the license to go out and, you know, seek an interpretation that's going to bind the rest of us? Um, you know, secondly, we need to do everything we can to, you know, foster greater clarity and predictability in enforcement. And, you know, I'd commend uh, the Linux Foundation, uh, Linux Kernel Project, you know, the conservancy in developing, you know, this idea about, you know, the enforcement statement that the Kernel Project just announced, uh, which was to adopt GPL v3 termination provisions for use of um, GPL v2 code. Uh, at least in the kernel and more broadly. I think that's the type of thing we need to be thinking about uh, as we think of ourselves as licensed advocates. So some other uh, ideas. So um, you know, something that we, we've talked about is maybe uh, we can get together and, and document some of those interpretations that we believe informally are, um, uh, you know, adhered to or, or kind of supported by um, members of the community around a particular license. Um, we often think in particular of the GPL, GPLv2, GPLv3. But, you know, we have, I think, um, I remember Jim Wright talking about this last year at this event, um, maybe a, a, a somewhat related topic. But we, we, we um, you know, we have particular projects, um, you know, that, that, um, from time to time, a situation will come up, and they, they will kind of opine on how how a license should be interpreted. And you have uh, uh, you know discussions that take place across communities and projects. And but a lot of this is not written down and documented and, and kind of collected in one place. And and maybe we can do more to to do that. Um, we 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 I don't think we explicitly mentioned Patrick McCarty yet, but but this is, Patrick McCarty is a, a, a former um, NetFilter developer who has brought a, a series of uh, lawsuits in, in Germany, kind of taking advantage of some features of the German uh, civil procedure system uh, in a way that has, has uh, many of us concerned. And um, w w there's particular concern about, about uh, you know, we hear about uh, McCarty um, raising certain you know, um, theories of GPL interpretation that, that we consider uh, out of line or, or, or um, um, you know, out of step with with longstanding community interpretation. And can we can we do more to to um, gain control of the situation by documenting um, what we actually believe uh, should be the the correct interpretation uh, of a given point of, of say the GPL GPLv2 um, as to a, a given issue? So maybe we can do that. We have not you know taken steps to do that yet, but I think that's. Uh, in, in a sense, sort of um, taking up on a role that the Free Software Foundation used to, to play more in the past. Another sort of related idea is um, we, we believe that, that in many ways we, we can promote more um, liberal and, and kind of modernized interpretations of licenses that we've been using for a long time while still upholding the policy goals of the license. Um, you know, we can do this, and this can encourage compliance, it can make compliance easier. I remember a couple of years ago, Mishi had a panel that I was on where she talked about um, how, you know, how compliance is sort of, it's not a difficult thing, GPL compliance. But I think that there is this, this perception in the industry that it is a difficult thing, that, that actually affects adoption, seeing some of these lawsuits uh, um, in, in Germany um, has, has affected that and has created kind of a bad climate around, around um, uh, you know the GPL, and I, I think if we if we um, try to look towards promoting um, more permissive interpretations uh, while upholding strong copyleft in the case of the GPL, I think that that could be a good solution to that, that before problem. You, before you go on to the next slide, I mean, just as, as an example here, um, and Jim and I were talking about this yesterday over coffee. Uh, you know, thinking about the Internet of Things, right? You can have you know some small device. It's a light bulb, right? Um, that has GPL code in it. You know, how do you deliver, you know, a copy of the license agreement and source code, you know, with a light bulb, right? I mean, you have to drop, you know, a CD-ROM in the box, you know, with the light bulb. Um, you know, do you have a an SD card that you have to put in there? I mean, what's what's the right way to do that? Um, you know, at one point, 
uh, you know, delivering code via magnetic tape or punch cards, you know, or floppy disks was the way to do it. Uh, it moved to CD-ROM. Um, but today, I mean, if I had a, a CD uh, up here, how many of you would be able to read what was on that CD? I mean, very few of you, right? Uh, one in the back. Um, and so we need to be thinking about sort of keeping these licenses alive, keeping, you know, thinking about how we're going to interpret them in the context of technology today. I mean, after all, it is the Internet of Things, right? And so we've got to be thinking about how the Internet's going to play a role in, uh, in license compliance. And so we have to make sure that, again, uh, to ensure the vitality of the license, that uh, our means of compliance uh, moves along. Yeah, and uh, so something that, that uh, after the experience of GPLv3 that, that uh, Evan and I and others, uh, some of whom are here, shared, um, Evan pointed out, you know, after GPLv3, you will, we'll never see a free software license or a major free software license updated again without a similarly transparent um, uh, public process. And I think that, that that's right. I think there is this, that, that GPLv3, one of its lasting uh, benefits was creating this expect expectation that that future versions of major licenses should be drafted publicly and transparently. Um, something that 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 I think we should look towards when that happens is is uh, having um, revisions of major licenses focus on this issue of the mechanics of compliance, making making um, uh, and termination, making termination more forgiving, making compliance easier and more straightforward. Um, I'm not sure that that's. I think to some degree that, that that's been true of the more complex licenses that have been drafted uh, since GPLv3, but I think that's something that we have to bear in mind. And another thing is, you know, maybe we should consider a more rapid um, life cycle for upgrading licenses than I think the free software community is accustomed to. So yeah, I promised in the beginning I would tell you the rest of the Wunsler or the, um, the Lorax story. Uh, so, unfortunately for the truffle trees, the Wunsler didn't listen to the Lorax uh, and did nothing to preserve, replant, or otherwise nurture his supply of truffle trees. And without raw materials, the Wunsler's factory shut down, the Lorax disappeared. Uh, but where the Lorax had last stood, there was a small monument that was engraved with a single word, unless. And the Wunsler sort of pondered this message for many years until he finally realized what the Lorax meant. So unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing's going to get better. It's not. So, you know, at the risk of sort of wearing out my little analogy here, you know, I wanted to make sure that, you know, we're all thinking about, you know, these threats. We take the threat seriously. We're not complacent. You know, every resource, you know, needs a Lorax, but, you know, perhaps one that's sort of more successful than this Lorax was in protecting the, uh, the truffle trees. Uh, so with that, thank you very much. Appreciate your. Let's, uh, let's see if we can uh, do violence to the elegance of this uh, <laughs> wonderful presentation. Um, what do you think about this uh, Free is the air to common use. Uh, oh, that was a good title. Uh, element of, of the idea of legal institutions as themselves commons. Uh, so I, uh, I actually thought this was, um, it's not just that legal institutions themselves as commons, but what grabbed me about your description was um, the, um, the similarity to Balinese water temple. Uh, which is to say, um, in the Indonesian Green Revolution, there was an effort to rationalize one of the longest standing commons of water districts in Bali. Uh, and in the effort to standardize and rationalize and bring it on board with formal public culture, completely destroyed, destroyed uh, the water districts, destroyed the water around Bali, and, 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 and that's what you're describing. What you're describing is a context in which taking a community-developed, uh, richly contextually understood institutional framework, the license, and trying to translate it into the rationality of state law by mm. harnessing the lawyers, you're essentially creating dramatic erosion 
in the system that this uh, set of practices is supposed to mm -hmm. limit. So I think one major thing to, to sort of put on the table, and I, I know you want me to push back, but instead of, is that this particular set of licenses, like this particular set of licenses, uh, like um, like the religious re rituals of the Balinese water temples, uh, was internally coherent, consistent with the understanding of the community by the community and its practices, and the effort to harness the rationality of the state through the courts is fouling the commons. That's what I read you as saying, and that's a fairly direct uh, plug-in into what was probably the central policy implication of the entire Ostrom School. Yeah, I, I too think it, 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 it was Ellie's ghost that was here. I, of course, was all lawyerly and stuff. I said licenses were the constitutions of communities. Uh, and uh, what that meant, of course, uh, implied a kind of internal republicanism. The, the licenses held communities together, and the communities, well, they adapted the licenses. They were the copyright holders. They had the right to give whatever permissions they wanted to give and to insert whatever modifications they wanted to insert. And the more centrally they held the copyright, the more that could be benevolent despot or benevolent dictator forever or whatever it was. But the governance situation that arose out of it was, like all constitutional life, an attempt to go on from day to day in a fashion that would not generate uh, radical dissent and terrible internal struggle. Uh, if you're the lawyers for those things, as Michi and I and our colleagues have been for a dozen years now, you understand that that without internal struggle stuff is a bunch of crap. Um, but it's privileged and you have lawyers and they help you. They work it out with you. Our practice, I tell the students who come to work in it, is a counseling practice. And the three most important words ever spoken in that practice are, and what then, which is our version of unless, right? Uh, always the question is, so you're going to do this, and then what? And what then? What, what after you have fought this one to a total satisfactory victory against your colleagues in the project who would wish to do it a different way, what then? Uh, so that from my point of view, what you have really said in that uh, particular logic was we should try to avoid extrajudicial efforts with respect to our constitutional law. It just so happens that these extrajudicial efforts occur in court, uh, which is where our extrajudicial efforts lie. This is why Richard and I were for a generation entirely sparing about litigation because we didn't have to conduct it. Uh, what we did was we said we don't want to ha lose our record for never having to bang on people. Why don't you just help us by cooperating? That was why my first phone call was always, we don't want money, we don't want publicity. We want to solve the problem and we will not take more and we won't take less, so why don't you help us solve the problem? It was certainly the case that every once in a while I had to get to the point of saying, Mr. or Ms. So-and-so, you know, I've never had to sue anybody please help me keep my record. And I never had to go past that, not in 16 years of life. In the end, when we occasionally went past it, we did so only because we thought there were so many new entrants to the republic that we had to remind people that there was law here and that they had to obey it. And I feel about that, that it's really a damn good thing that we didn't say we're going to build a wall and people who can't obey the law, we're going to throw them out. Because if we had done that, we would have ruined the whole thing immediately. I do see these as very fragile commons. Copyleft in particular is a fragile commons. Uh, well, that's not what you want to say when you're on the telephone with somebody you want to have do it right. Uh, you don't want to say, Mr. Miss So-and-so, I've never had to risk the entirety of the commons by suing anybody. Please help me keep my record. But of course I meant that too, right? As we all do all the time when we are carrying these things in our hands. 
You want to know when not to bring constitutional litigation? That's why cert is necessary in the United States Supreme Court. One of the consequences of cert is that when it would be a bad idea to deal with this question, we don't deal with it. We say, let's let it percolate a while. Let's wait for more disagreement in the circuits. Let's hold off on this a while and see where it goes. That's why, of course, Louis Brandeis, who is as wise about constitutionalism as you can be wise, says that the most important thing we do is not doing. What, what, what this is about is that proposition, that if we are comrades in this and we are carrying this republic in our hands, and if Yochai and I are right in seeing the future as we see it these days, the layer within which we work is surrounded by dynamite all over, then figuring out how the most important thing we do is not doing is really crucial. And of course, it better not turn out that not doing means not caring about the Constitution anymore, or not living by it, or not demanding that the rights under it be recognized by everybody. That's why it's hard doing the Supreme Court in Washington, D.C. That's why it's hard doing stewardship of a license. That's why it's hard packaging 55,000 or 32,000 packages and sending them out into the world to make sure that everybody can use them freely and make them better freely without trenching on some place where you break the glass because it says, in case of emergency, break glass, and you decided today was an emergency. Right? And what then? And what then? which is what you always want the five guys or five people sitting on the Supreme Court bench telling you what the Constitution is today to have thought about. And what then? I learned that from Thurgood Marshall, right? That's a thing you ask at conference. And what then? That's a thing you say when there's only nine people in a room and five votes determine the future of the United States Constitution. And what then? You know there are a whole lot of people in Washington, D.C. these days who are asking that question a whole lot more urgently and with a whole lot more fear in their hearts than they were 12 months ago today. I take what you're saying with the utmost seriousness, right? This, this is the problem. We have to do it right, and we have to do it with restraint, and we have to do it with an understanding that the layer at which we are working is not the only layer and it cannot be sufficient in itself. Did I say it right, or do you want to say it better? Uh, you, said, you said more than enough. <laughs> so uh, I, I, I also want to say, by way of bridging to the next conversation, that the point about all this is that social technology can really work, um, that, that we don't have to do it by agitating questions. We can do it by improving process. Uh, that's a lawyer kind of a thing to think, you know. Uh, that the way you do constitutional law better isn't necessarily by driving every question to a test case. In fact, the driving everything to a test case is the lawyer's response to the inability to get procedure to work. And we have not exhausted that opportunity by any means yet, and that's where we want to go next. Jeremiah, you want to say something? I, I wanted to ask a question because um, the talk was very pragmatic and it has a direct impact on some of the work that I do when I try and satisfy compliance in the automotive industry. But, but one thing I also think is a risk, you, you talk about we need to have more licenses updated more often. Uh, to do that, I think we need license consolidation because in a large uh, free software distribution in a field like automotive, the complexity is so vast of license interactions alone let alone software interactions. Um, I just don't see how we can manage upgrades unless we have greater consolidation. What, what's your think? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I have, people have been talking about the need for license consolidation and free software licenses for as long as I've been involved in, in this field. Um, I, I've always been very skeptical about that, and I think for, for a complex combination of uh, emotional and, and non-emotional, Reasons. Um, I think we, we we are sort of moving in that direction anyway. So so the the um, the fact that there is this there's, there's a successful campaign 
uh, from the bottom up uh, against license proliferation, as people used to call it, and and um, the, the just the natural standardization, de facto standardization that took place um, over you know 10 or 20 years over a, a relatively small set of licenses, even though in a distribution like Fedora or Red Hat Enterprise Linux, there are um, hundreds of distinct licenses at least. Um, for new software, new software tends to, new software that is free software, tends to choose from uh, and, and make use of a set of licenses that is actually very small. So I, I've, I've generally seen that as a, you know, I've seen that as a positive development. I, I think that that sort of obviates the need for some kind of more active form of consolidation. But there, there are people who call for a kind of creative commons-like approach to um, free software licenses, and, and I, I, I've been, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe to some degree on, on aesthetic grounds, I've been skeptical about whether that's a good idea. But uh, worth reconsidering, I guess. Uh, uh, following up on that a little bit, just two things that wanted to make sure we don't miss them. The first is, um, however self-disciplined the community itself might be in, the, in terms of not bringing, um, or sort of core aspects of the community in not bringing state rationalization into what is essentially a commons uh, a governance structure. Uh, once you are in automotive in various, you can't control who brings actions. And so I really want to focus, I'd be really interested in hearing how you think about following the one path of the things you said that seem to me to be uh, feasible and incredibly important, which is to create publicly readable sense of the community interpretations that then could be brought by lawyers as evidence. I think even in much less um, conducive context, like fair use in online video or fair use in documentary, the kind of work that Pat Aufterhaudi and Peter Yazi did in Washington around creating the appearance of consensus of practitioners of the meaning of fair use, say, in documentary, ended up influencing the way the insurance industry interpreted it, ended up being an input into court. So I think that strikes me as a genuine solution that needs to be pushed. And then back on this question, uh, when you, exactly when you talked about updating, there's a real stable interfaces that are simple are really important for rapid change. And so how do you play off between the uh, continuous updating at the interface as opposed to really settling on a fairly set of simple and stable interfaces and allowing modularity to operate around that and having the licenses be driven by that uh, requirement, particularly as you get into more complex and integrated uh, systems. Yeah, I think, that's, I think that's really important. So I'm working on that. That's called simplified copyleft. Uh, the, the, the problem, Jeremiah, occurs at the boundary between communities. If licenses are the constitutions of community, then the rules of international trade either consist of beggar thy neighbor policies. My license is more demanding than yours, so I'm the one who ultimately determines how the car works. Uh, or uh, you have a set of, uh, of understandings which can be updated in real time, uh, what in the world of simplified copyleft as I'm trying to build it constitute the, uh, the constraint packs or the code that sits out there in the world that everybody can point at and read and which says in any given si question of interaction, this is what the parties have agreed on. Uh, if I ever used the word smart contracts to mean contracts made by smart people, I would call this smart contracts, but they're not, of course. So, uh, and, and, and we can do that. In order to do that, we need a, a unified way of teaching everybody what we've just decided. Uh, uh, Richard Fontana and I spent more time on rationale documents uh, explaining the GPL3 successive drafts than we spent arguing with Richard Stallman, which is saying something. Uh, and, and, and without those rationale documents, without what we saw as the legislative history of what we were doing, it would have been impossible to explain to anybody what we are doing well enough for people to learn the rules. You have to teach the rules. You can't just state the rules. This is why, if you will permit me to defend my day job, we have law school. You know, uh, if, you, if you could just publish the rules and never have to explain to people how to think about them, then I, I would have to do th this job for money don't want to do. Um, so, so we have to find ways of teaching the rules. They have to be teachable. 
That means they can't change every day and they can't be too obscure and notwithstanding the fact that we have to cover all the corners and prevent evasion in all the places where we need to prevent evasion, we have to be able to teach people how to build their products. We have to be able to give them checklists and we have to train them in how to fill those checklists out. And that's why the open chain idea uh, is from my point of view the crucial idea that helps to bridge this gap because no matter how we do it, no matter how we write those resources, no matter how we take care of those resources, we have to teach people how to drink the water so as not to, well, you know what in it. Uh, and and that, that's not a problem of threatening to cut it off if people pee in the water. It's a problem of explaining that the way we run this ecology around here is clean water goes over there and wastewater goes over here and then we decide uh, how, how, how to live in a balanced water ecology. Uh, that's what prevents tragedy of the commons. You understand what prevents tragedy of the commons? This is what Ellie was teaching us and we were listening carefully. It's embedded in the culture, you understand. It's not a rule set, it's a way of life. And you have to be able to teach the way of life. That is to say, you have to be able to raise your children and the newcomers and the immigrants and all the other people you love really a lot. You have to be able to teach them how it works. Um, otherwise, you wind up with a deforested condition and a little monument to here there used to be a forest. Please learn the lesson from this. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you.